Welcome to the Sourcing Industry Landscape Podcast, hosted by Don Tura, CEO and President of SIG. Well, folks, I want to welcome you back to the podcast. My name is Dawn Tura, and I am so excited to welcome to the studio today, Dr. Patricia Connolly. Now, she's the founding partner and CEO of an amazing company that we've just had the pleasure of getting to know recently. The company's name is SMC Squared, and Dr. Connolly draws on nearly three decades of executive IT and academic leadership to both create and implement the, the SMC Squared strategy, vision, and mission. So rather than reading a big bio, I want to start off by welcoming you, Dr. Connolly. Well, thanks, Don. I'm thrilled to be here with you today. Yeah, so I would love for us to go down a little journey and talk about where you come from, why you started SMC Squared, and then I have some questions that I hope you have time to answer. So, but before we get started, folks, we are going to have a quick word from our sponsor, and when we return, you're going to hear more from our guest, Dr. Patricia Polley of SMC Squared. What is SIG University? We are an inclusive, internationally recognized university whose mission is to advance the procurement profession while enabling students to transform their careers through our world-class certifications. SIG University offers industry-recognized certifications programs, each offering a unique set of competencies and skills that sourcing and risk professionals need to be successful. The programs provide advanced training in subjects like strategic sourcing, supplier management, third-party risk management, intelligent automation, and more. SIG University is committed to academic excellence, which is why our students are trained alongside an international cohort, engage in discussion forums, and learn from senior practitioner faculty who leverage their deep industry experience with real-world case studies. Why SIG University? It was created originally at the request of SIG members. We knew there was a lot of training out there, but nothing designed around the ever-evolving skills and competencies that the modern sourcing and risk professional needs. The programme was created through collaborating with dozens of industry experts to create a curriculum that is bold, fresh and applicable to this day and age. If you're looking to advance your knowledge and your career, join us at SIG University. So Dr. Connolly, I am very curious. First off, I love the name of your company, but you have a, an incredible background before you started SMC Square. Can you just share a little bit about your journey to where you are today and then a little bit about what your company does? Sure, and thanks for asking. You know, we, we all have all these uh, long years of history in, in working in IT and building our careers. But I think for me, it really started out um, growing up in a family that valued engineering and education. And that really was inspiring, especially as a young girl. I was uh, at the drafting table with my father and listening to his stories and watching my brother's uh, pursue their careers. And it was really um, good for me as a, as a girl growing up in a tech family. So I was fortunate for that. I went to the University of Minnesota, did an undergraduate, studied computer science, went on and did an MBA, and then went on and did a doctorate, building on a lot of interest in um, not just tech, but business and international. I worked for KPMG out of school. I spent 25 years with Target so a lot of years in that corporate seat, um, doing mostly development work, uh, working with um, IT and business leaders to, to grow Target and just had an extremely uh, wonderful career opportunity with Target and then spent time with Polaris, uh, a great power sports company, and then turned our attention over to building and driving these young companies, the fourth and fifth of which for me are SMC Squared. So it's, it's been a bit of an unexpected journey. If somebody would have said, would you be um, starting up and running a tech firm? I would have probably said no. But I think opportunity is just very exciting to look at. I've always been encouraged to um, go after things. And I kind of kind of lead in front of my skis sometimes mm -hmm. as I think about opportunities. But SMC Squared got started because we had spent mm -hmm. as partners all this time in corporate America, really in the buyer seat and had a perspective on how offshoring and outsourcing was done even before Y2K really. 
and looking at kind of the pitfalls and problems and really the opportunities to work with great, great talent globally. So when we got around to building SMC Squared, we had a lot going on, you know, with our background to draw from. And that's really how it all began was going to market um, after we had sold our initial company and I think thinking about what we can really bring that's quite different, but really um, in a way to put it kind of to serve our colleagues and our peers, because we had a lot of experience to bring. So I'll, I'll mention SMC Squared is uh, kind of named with the idea of one of my favorite people in history and certainly a brilliant mind, Albert Einstein. So his iconic formula was feeder into uh, our company's name and SMC are the initials of our partners, me being the C, the Connolly part of it all. So that's how we came up with the name. And we really wanted to bring something that was just smart and flexible and meaningful to um, corporate, corporate America. So, but so if you can help me a little bit, you also talk about the birth of the GIC as a mature captive model. Can you share with our audience what a GIC is and what it is you actually do then within SMC Squared? Yeah, absolutely. So um, many of us are familiar with uh, a captive, which is a term that we don't like to use anymore. It's got a lot of bad connotation, of course. And we are also familiar with offshoring and outsourcing. So a GIC or a global insourcing center is really a blend of the best of both of those. And it also takes into consideration what are the risks and possible issues if you're building out one versus the other. So we wanted to mitigate those risks. A global insourcing center is a model that, that we build holistically from the ground up for organizations building IT capabilities. And then at a point in time, companies have the opportunity to transition that team. Similar to a BOT or a build operate transfer, we do it a little bit differently that helps companies with uh, the financial side of that in that we take care of all the capital in and we take care of all the operational risk. So a GIC is really the new form of an of a IT captive. And many companies are familiar with those. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of large companies have been able to do them with success, Target being one of the first. But a lot of companies kind of hold off from it because it does take a lot of capital and quite honestly, a lot of know-how. So your GICs, are these offshore? Can they be in multiple locations? Do you always build it up from a, a, a one particular center? Yeah, so we've had tremendous experience in India. So we've chosen India to be our global headquarters in addition to the United States. We have offices in Texas and in Minnesota. And we've chosen India basically because of the huge wealth of talent. Um, Gartner, NASCOM, Forrester, others have done studies about global talent, but the overall strength in India is with their highly educated talent pool, as well as the cost advantages. So we've decided to settle in there. We may expand to different geographies in the future, but we really have found it to be continuing to be a very strong uh, geography for us. Good. So... I, and I do hope all of your folks are healthy and, and have come through COVID okay too, because I know I, I know India was suffering quite badly. Yeah. Um, yes, thanks for asking. We're doing we're doing really well, and and I'm very very thankful for that. We actually recently hosted our own vaccination drive in our offices, so we really are very concerned about not just our employees but their families, and we were happy to extend that benefit to them. Wow, that is wonderful. I love that. I love having a caring boss like that. It's, it's really nice to hear. So the, how long has SMC Squared been around? So we've been in existence for four years. Our previous company dated back to 2008. Uh, and we sold that organization and, and did reasonably well. So we funded this organization in 2017. Um, Gartner, Gartner was involved with us in the beginning, kind of hearing our, our storyline and what we wanted to do. And they have moved us from talking about us as being disruptive and a startup to really being a challenger in this IT services space. So we're, we're kind of onto that next level of growth and, and very, very thankful and very excited to be here. Oh, that is exciting. 
So can you talk about retention and and why are you seeing potentially different results from other companies in IT services firms? Oh, that's a really critical question, especially today. The market right now is seeing a tremendous amount of churn. This is no news to anyone. Um, A lot of people leaving for other opportunities, a lot of people leaving for personal reasons, uh, needing different sets of benefits for family or for whatever their, their reason is all valid, but the market is is kind of upsetting itself right now and companies are scrambling. Um, Attrition rates are probably about 30 plus percent globally and companies, very stable companies with long tenured people are really experiencing a lot of of pain because of this. Um, We've had an ongoing and even through COVID and even now a very, very strong retention rate. Our retention hovers right around 90% and we look at that on a month. Wait a minute, ninety percent in yes. India. Yes, yes, uh, it oh. is. It is a surprising thing, and I'm really a stickler for making sure our numbers are correct. So we we do measure this every month, and we measure it across all of our clients. So there's no special special mm-hmm. treatment, special handling in the numbers. Uh, it's very very true, authentic information. Wow. Um, but we we look at it differently, and I think this kind of goes back to you know who we are as people, you know, we, we value people. We don't look at our, our global team as uh, commodity players. We, we know them, they have names and families and we care about them. And when we hire them, that's the value prop. They're hired as valued employees and they are hired specifically to work for an organization, a company that has engaged us to build their team. So they have a specific place and a specific specific value, and we have a great opportunity to retain them. And um, that message of being a valid, valued member of the team is, in some cases, pretty different today. So um, that's that's a big part of it. I'd say the other part of it, from a from a client looking at us perspective, is we hire to fit. Uh, We use kind of a precision way of looking at hiring. So we're not just taking uh, the next folks off the bench that are available that kind of sort of meet the need. We go to market and really make sure that we're hiring to fit from a technical perspective, from a communication skill perspective and soft skills, and also from a cultural perspective. And this can be widely different based on, of course, technical need. But if you're working for a Wall Street firm or Northern Minnesota a uh, wonderful family-owned firm, you've got different cultures and you need to take that into consideration when you're hiring. So we're, um, we're really uh, excited to talk about this. It's, as I said, it's very authentic, but there's definitely reasons behind um, why this works differently than contractors or global uh, employees of some kind. So what kind of technical skills can you actually provide them? For your clients? Yeah, so today, um, the majority of technologies that we're being asked to build capabilities in are around data and digital. No big surprise. Lots of different technology areas, new technologies as well that are coming on. And that's where we see um, the great asset of our India education system helping out our US companies. Many times we're able to bring talent to the table that US companies can't access or talent that's been skilled in areas that are not yet readily available in the US market. So we can help lead with that. In fact, I'm just excited. We just promoted um, a young woman that is leading a digital practice for a US client, and she's taken on the whole capability globally for them. So wonderful opportunity for her. She absolutely deserves it, but it's not just about supplying engineers or workers were supplying leaders and thinkers and and really helping companies drive strategy. So I'd say data digital is is really at the top of the list. And then we go into different skill areas based on need around another area development. So this could be enterprise skills like SAP Oracle or as niche as Flutter developers, which is which is a you know fun thing to talk about, but India does have um, quite a bit of range in in talent available and even in those very new technologies that have just been on the market and in use for just a few years. And then things like cyber. No, keep going. Just a proper question. That's all. 
Yeah, things like things like cybersecurity, another big area for us, as well as innovation teams. So many companies are just driving so fast. They have great ideas, but they don't have the technology skills to go work those things out into uh, an MVP. And, and that's something that we can do as well. And then bring those ideas back to us to see if they want to move ahead on those. So those are the technology areas. The other side of this coin is really in business services. Um, business services, meaning accounting, finance, uh, legal, vendor management, uh, marketing, merchandising, lots of different things that need to happen. And sometimes those skills are needed as well. And business services can be built into a GIC, but then it grows the scope, right? We're beyond IT at that point. We're growing into business areas, business operations, and the terminology on that changes a little bit there too, as well. We call it um, global capability centers because it's really looking at multiple capabilities in addition to IT for a company. That's amazing. So you did mention data. Do you have data scientists that you can employ? We do. We do. When this all began, we were really interested to see what the market would hold for us and, and how that would work. But I, I would say we've been tremendously successful in bringing not only um, very high skilled PhD level data scientists to the table, but all of the analytics and reporting that need to happen. So we have very broad data teams and uh, really excited about that practice area. I would love to talk to you after the podcast about a special project because data scientists are so needed in the sourcing industry. And we have, you know, we've talked, it's funny, we talked for 10 years about big data, you know, that it was coming, that we're going to have all this data. And then suddenly people said, all right, now I have all this data. I don't have the faintest idea what to do with it or how to analyze it. And so procurement organizations so badly need that talent. So I'd love to talk to you offline about a special project. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, am I allowed to ask you about typical costs? Is that anything that you want to share with our audience or is that? Yeah, yeah absolutely. That's fine. Okay. I, I guess I sometimes joke. I'm, I'm so old that I really just need to be very on the table and authentic. There's no, there's no mess around with me. <laughs> anymore. Um, and, and I think it's important, right? So we talk about it in terms of kind of a range of cost. Um, we're very competitive even with the very large um, global sourcing organizations for IT. And we're super competitive compared to the, the big US-based organizations. Um, so I won't name any, but you can kind of fill in the blanks. So typical costs um, for our teams uh, at the individual role level, and US folks like to talk about it in terms of hourly rate, but I'll, I'll explain this in a moment range from, I'd say about the high 20s to about the high 30s in terms of hourly rate. So it all blends out if you're putting together large organizations or, or even medium-sized organizations, probably about $33 an hour, which is really competitive. The reason why we can offer really competitive rates is we're a very lean organization. We're, we're hiring to need, so we don't have to carry a, a big bench to Yes, you know, we're, we're really very specific, very precision oriented when it comes to team and talent. And we know India operations very, very well. So in terms of negotiating and lease arrangements and operating costs, we, we know this extremely well. We've been doing business in India since 2005. Mm -hmm. so, so that's a cost piece that is good to understand that you know, high 20s to high 30s with kind of that 33 blended rate is something we, we chat about. Um, the other side of this is something called true cost. And, and this was really a big awareness factor to me when I left Target and had this conversation with one of my TCS leaders, again, previous TCS leader, because I was no longer uh, engaging him. I was no longer at Target. So I kind of got a little under the covers look and it really piqued my interest. So true cost is really when you take out all, all the margin play. And true cost is something that we focus on for companies that are building GICs with us. So if you're walking down that road and your intent is to um, take the team into your own entity, usually it's about two to three years down the road, after it's matured, after it's a proven entity, the true cost is a really big factor that catches the eye of procurement folks and CFOs because um, 
they don't understand it, just like I didn't understand it in the beginning. But we target it and we target it contractually. We're that confident in it. So at a true cost rate, we talk about true cost being under $20 an hour. And that's an all-inclusive number. It's talent, it's operations, it's hardware, software, it's security. Um, so when companies hear that and they start figuring out kind of what their overall talent strategy is, it really becomes a pretty um, interesting factor for them to consider, not just how do you build this and sustain it, but then what that cost pattern is coming out of it. That is, that, that is a great number to be able to talk about too. So, you know, we, since we, you and I met actually through a mutual acquaintance from Target Days, Bill Seedoff, who's also always been a SIG member and, and then he left Target, went to Ecolab as a senior director of global procurement. Yeah. So when you bring all of this back, how can you help procurement organizations since that's primarily our audience? Right. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll go to Bill's story. So he had a great background from Target, really went into Ecolab with a tremendous, I would say, um, suitcase full of tools and experiences. And, you know, he'll, he'll talk about this um, at your conference coming up, I'm sure, but it's, it's, a, it's an interesting weave of um, providing to procurement folks uh, like, like Bill, um, this value proposition of what can they bring strategically to the table to organizations to really make a difference. And um, the, the nuts and bolts of putting together contracts is very, very difficult at times, but when you have a strategic view and a goal in mind, it becomes much more clear. And I think that's something that Bill really saw and embraced and what we are able to do with our procurement partners, who I love that we have great relationships with is really provide that, that roadmap of, of how do you build a team differently? How do you bring value to the organizations? And how do you have a strategic sightline? That's neat. So you also have a case study, if I'm not mistaken, around fossil. Could you share a little bit about that one? Yeah, yeah, you can, you can read about it or, or hear an interview on it on our website if you wish, but fossil story is really interesting. So uh, I got to know fossil, believe it or not, through a football watch party. I, I was not there in a sales <laughs> mode. I was just watching Notre Dame football and, and had a great afternoon and ended up meeting somebody who asked, you know, what I did and gave, you know, the brief, brief storyline because we were more focused on the game. And it ended up um, with an invitation to go sit down with the Fossil CIO, Mary Von Onnen, and her team and talk about what was going on in that organization. They had uh, 300 contractors on board, basically doing all the hands-on keyboard work for Fossil, and it, and it simply wasn't working out. They were being charged um, almost two times as much as they expected to be charged because there was this clause that allowed them to be charged over time. And the performance, the quality, uh, the productivity of the organization that they had engaged just wasn't there. So they were really wanting to figure out what was next in their talent strategy. And uh, the organization really needed them. They, they had great business demand, but they needed to meet. So when we sat down and talked about it, we kind of went right to the numbers and we were really amazed at um, the difficulty that they were in. And when we started looking at and breaking down different capability teams from uh, development, SAP, cyber, even support, we were able to take that 300 person contractor team to 180, and do the same amount of work and provide a tremendous payback to Fossil. So as we started up, we basically began with one capability area. Um, they were able to show savings and that savings fueled the next one and the next one and the next one. It was kind of a domino effect, but we had to really teach them. How do you do this differently? How do you build a global team, work with a global team differently and put aside this contractor kind of hourly mindset that that gets set in place in many organizations mm -hmm. and really look at the whole team differently. But the savings was tremendous. And um, we still are in touch with Fossil. They have transitioned from us, um, but we're still in touch with them as good friends and colleagues and really excited for their success. So in, when they transition, that means that you've done this, you've gone in and built the team, and then they've 
they've lifted that team over to then report directly to them. Is that correct? Absolutely. So when we hire, we always hire saying you are working for Fossil or Ecolab or any number of our other clients. We're kind of standing behind y'all. You know, we're, we're the ones that are powering what's going on with our best practices, our um, way of looking at this model. And it is really the company's success and the team's success that is first and foremost in our mind. So with Fossil, as with others, um, they go through a, a transition process with us. It's a right to hire process. So it's very advantageous to U.S. companies. There's no um, acquisition valuation involved. Um, it also helps the team feel like they've always been with that company. So that stickiness uh, is very important because many of us have gone through mergers and ac acquisitions where you kind of feel like you're sold or you kind of feel like your culture has just been ripped away from you and now it's something different. And that's a time when many companies experience a lot of attrition. But with this, it's all built with the idea that it's going to transition and it's the same company through and through. So do you, do you often, and, and this is just sort of an ancillary question, do you help train them on how to retain these people and teach them your management style? Is that part of what you do when, when you're going through the transition? We do. And in fact, my partner was just on the phone um, working with HR with a very sizable client that is planning to transition in Q1 of next year. So we are very much uh, teachers. I would say that's probably my, my base personality is I, I love to teach. And it's important that, they, that companies are able to sustain this post-transition as well. But I will say something has come up during COVID that we, we kind of didn't expect as much. Many companies came to us and said, heard about your model, really are interested, especially with all the constraints of what COVID brought. Um, can you do this as a managed service? And, and we said, yes. Um, we started out with a few companies that said, we don't ever want to transition. We're going to, we're going to, we want to build a GIC, but we want you to run it for us. And, you know, maybe years down the road, we'll, we'll address that. But because of um, just the, the instability in the market and risk concerns, they just said, can you build this team? I, I sometimes say with the same push-ups and sit-ups as a GIC that would be transitioned and um, really build it with those same principles in mind. So we have a, interestingly, we have a number of clients now that are managed service clients. And they have annual renewable contracts with us. And, um, you know, we have great skin in the game to make sure that it continues to work extremely well with the idea that they could have an option in the future to transition. Well, that's a great way for companies to go into it, especially with the market volatility right now. I think yeah. that's fantastic. But do you keep, so talk, I know one of the big problem areas that we see is that quality tends to fall off with, well, the normal contractor model that we hear a lot from our members that quality was really good in the beginning, but now that they've sort of been there for a while, the quality's yeah. has dropped. Is that something that, that you focus on and keeping that quality just as high as it was when they first began? Yeah. So my partners and I are all technologists, you know, we're, we're all engineers at heart. That's how we grew up. So we definitely have a lot of um, not just feeling about this, but deep, deep knowledge because we've run technology teams and we were responsible for productivity of the team, quality, sustainability of that software that we developed. So we have again, taken a bit of a different approach here and we're kind of flying in the face of something that is, is heard often. I even hate to say it, but many times it takes, you know, two or three contractors, at least that's the perception to do the work of a U.S. Um, a US employee. I would say in some cases it's true, some cases it's perception, but we wanted to deal with that right up front. Mm -hmm. So we have a guarantee that we will be um, working on the methodologies to the standards of our clients and we will provide one-to-one -one productivity and quality with anyone on their team. We are that confident of the people that we're hiring and we're also really confident of our ways of working and, and the ways that we engage our best practices for a global team. So that one-to-one -one productivity factor is a big differentiator and we're, we're out there talking about it all the time. Yeah, one-to-one, -one, I've never heard anyone actually be able to achieve that. So 
kudos to you. And I have to tell you, you know, and, and I don't mean to, I don't mean to ever say anything disparaging, but engineers usually are not people people. And you come across so warm and genuine and people focus around, you know, the quality of the people, your turnover rates, everything. So you've got an amazing ability to both have the right brain and the left brain and the people skills and the EQ, mm-hmm. your EQ is off the chart. So is this something that you learned by being in the business world? So I'm, I'm interested in you, Dr. Holly, personally. And well, that's very sweet. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about that. How did you learn that the people are the most important part of the equation? You know, that, that's really very, very nice of you. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, I honestly, I'm going to credit my parents. They were um, super smart people, but they led with their heart. And we learned as a, a family that family was first. You know, you treat people well, you treat people the way you want to be treated. And if you lead like that, um, you know, it'll be meaningful for everybody. So even as a, a young manager at Target, you know, this was very important to me. And um, coming into this company, it was something that really resonated across our partners. So when we put together our company values, um, we use the acronym FACE uh, because, you know, everything's got to be an acronym, of course. And the F is actually family. So we really lead with those family values. And it's sometimes surprising to talk about, but once um, I think companies interact with us, they see that it's quite genuine and, and we're really proud of that. Yeah, well, you should be because you've you've got an amazing story that you tell. And what I would love to do, I know we're out of time today, but I'd love to bring you back and I want to get through the rest of your acronym next time we talk. Can we do that? Sure. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I'd love to invite you back. And folks, SMC Squared is new to SIG. So that's one of the reasons I'm so excited. And then to meet a CEO that is just so genuine is, is just uplifting for me as well. But I want you to reach out and, and make Dr. Conley part of your world and reach out to her through LinkedIn, reach out to me if you want a personal introduction, and then make sure when you're at the summit to pull her aside and get to know her because I have so enjoyed getting to know your company for these last few months. It has been such a pleasure. Well, thank you, Don. I, I'm excited to work with you and this thing going forward. Thank you. So folks, stay tuned to the podcast. There'll be more to this series where we'll be inviting Dr. Conley back. And just make sure that you listen and contribute and stay safe and stay healthy, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Connolly, for joining us today. Thanks, Don. Take care. Thank you for listening. Subscribe to the Sourcing Industry Landscape podcast through iTunes or your favorite podcast app. Want to nominate someone for an interview? Email us at info at sig.org.